Right, Genesis chapter 4. And we're going through Genesis in, at my church on Sunday nights. And um, I was always taken by the Cain and Abel story. So I thought I'd, I'd uh, when I preached on it, I, I, I thought I'd share it with you guys. Genesis 4, I'll bring you up to date on where we are in Scripture. As you know, Adam and Eve are created. They're given this beautiful garden to live in. But they sin and then they get forcibly ejected from the garden. God kicks them out. Those who have rebelled can no longer stay in the presence of a holy God. So now they're run out of the garden. And, of course, Adam and Eve are run out of the comfort and the security and the delight of that place. They were, they were with God and they felt safe and secure. But now they've been thrown out into the untamed earth. An earth that will be forever altered because of their sin. An earth now that has got thorns and thistles. A, a, a world where there are jungles and, uh, and vines that are going to strangle you and, and things to fall over and trip on. And the animals that God had made as their servants are now going to turn on them. So before the flood, animals had no fear of human beings. And so they would, they would attack Adam and Eve. They were going to have to defend themselves against the beasts. So now Adam and Eve are exiled and they have to make it on their own. Things look grim for them. They've been sentenced to death. And now they're surrounded by threats and they've got an uncertain future. Okay, let's talk film. Let's talk science fiction. And for 10 points, not Harry, because he's heard this sermon before. 10 points, who can tell me the full title of the first ever Star Wars film? The full title of the first one, the 1977 version. Addy? You're so close. Star Wars episode... No, not episode one, Addy. Come on, come on Ad, I thought you were a geek, man. <laughs> Star Wars... Episode 4, A New Hope. You all know the Star Wars story. By the time we get to episode 4, the Empire's been fully established, hasn't it? Darth Vader's doing his business with the, uh, with the Emperor. But there's hope because Luke Skywalker is going to rise up and defeat the evil Empire. So our first point this, this evening, and I went a long way about it, is chapter 4. A new hope. All right, see what I did there? So look how we begin on verses 1 and 2. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Eve means mother of all living, and now she fulfills that role. She su survives the agony of childbirth, and she's got a lovely new little boy. And look, she's full of faith, isn't she? She says, with the help of the Lord, with the help of Yahweh, I've brought forth a man. She sees this child as a blessing from God. God's preserved her life. And she calls him Cain. That's Hebrew for possession. I have gained something. I've got a possession. I've acquired him. He's mine. But why is Eve so excited? Well, remember, God promised Adam and Eve that one of their descendants would crush the serpent's head. One of their children is going to rise up and undo the trouble that the serpent has caused them. And what would that mean for Adam and Eve in reality? Well, it would mean that when the serpent was defeated, that they could go back into the garden. They needed someone to save them. They needed someone to reverse the curse. They want to get back inside the garden. They want to have their death sentence overturned. So Eve is quite rightly excited about this new little boy. Perhaps he is the serpent crusher. And it gets even better, verse 2. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now we've got two potential serpent crushers wandering around. Abel means breath. Where there's breath, there's life. So again, Adam and Eve are hoping that somehow their inevitable death 
can be overturned. Now, Adam and Eve have other children, we're told later on, but Moses doesn't go into detail about them here. Why not? Well, here we've got the first and second born of Adam and Eve, if you like. They are the first fruits. These are the first batch of new human beings. These two are going to set the trend when it comes to humanity. They will show us what everyone who comes after them is going to be like. And think about it, Cain being the firstborn, he's the heir to the throne of the world, isn't he? Adam is the big chief, he's the king, but when Adam dies, Cain will take over. He'll be the leader, he'll be the oldest and wisest man on earth. How is Cain then going to rescue humanity? How is he going to behave? And how is Abel, his brother, going to help him out? There is hope. There's new hope in chapter 4. Second point then is a tale of two sons. Now what we've got in front of us then is a simple and incredibly well-known story, isn't it? Or is it? Because the more I read these verses, the more questions arose from them. So for starters, where are these two brothers meeting with God? How, if they're outside of the Garden of Eden, can they talk to God and hear what he says? Why is Cain's sacrifice rejected? But why is Abel's accepted? What makes Cain so jealous of his brother? We might think we've been Christians a long time, we know this story, but actually none of these are simple questions to answer. So how are we going to do it? Well, to answer those questions in an engaging way, I'm going to tell you a little story, right? Hopefully this story will fill in the gaps and answer some of those questions, but big warning, all right? Big warning. This is very much my take on it. It's based on biblical principles. So as, as I tell you, you might hear things you hear from other pieces of scripture, but I've used a lot of imagination and a little bit, well, a lot of artistic license, right? So if at the end of this, you think, nah, see, that's a load of rubbish, old rubbish, then don't worry, all right? Don't panic, you're not, <laughs> they ain't gonna throw you out of the church. But afterwards, we can have a good lot of conversations about it, right? I'm already thinking Toye is going to rip me apart on this, but um, we'll see how we get on, right? What I'm going to explain in the next 10 minutes is my best reasonable explanation for what I think is going on in Genesis chapter 4. And whether you agree with what I say or not, the application we're going to get to at the end will remain the same anyway, whether or not you agree with how I present it or not. So, here's the story, and halfway through this, we're going to have a hymn, so we can sort of readjust, all right? So, Cain and, Abel, his, Cain and his brother Abel have been born. Let's fast forward about 18 years or so. Now, Adam and Eve have a, a good handful of children. Let's say they've got 12 children, and Eve is pregnant again. And the climate they live in is tropical and warm. That's what it would have been like before the flood. Adam and Eve have built themselves a home, a house. Adam has figured out how to make bricks and he's made some crude tools uh, to cut wood with and now he's built himself a nice little hut. So there's a family home. Why do they need a proper sturdy house? Well as I said the animals stalk them. The animals now eat each other and, given half a chance, they'll eat them. There are huge cats in the jungle. There are bigger dogs and terrifying lizards. They're roaming the forests and the plains, looking to eat Adam and Eve because they have no fear of man. So Adam needs a fortress. He needs somewhere where they can run and hide and defend themselves. Where has Adam set up home? Well, I think he wouldn't have gone far from the gate of Eden, would he? He's only a few hundred metres from there. The predatory animals, let's say, 
don't dare go too near to the gate. So that's where he sets up house. He needs to be on the holy mountain. So that's where Adam sets up camp and he feels safe there. He's near his old home. He longs to get back in the garden, so we're better to set up than right next to it. He's near God. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, as the old saying goes. Adam's oldest son, Cain, he wants to be just like his dad. So from a young age, verse 2, Cain worked the soil. Cain takes an interest in farming, working the ground. Remember, God had cursed the ground. But over time, Adam has had some success in making it fruitful. Adam figures out that he, he needs to water his plants regularly. So we keep getting water from the stream and pouring it all over them, and that makes them grow. He figures out um, that plants grow better if you throw animal dung on them. That's poo, kids, all right? I think that's on the thing. And his young son, Cain, also is good at this. He's got a natural ability with the ground. He figures out that some crops do better in different levels of light. So if he makes a little clearing in the forest, the crops grow better. And if he clips off the old dying bits of certain plants, they grow even bigger and faster. What about Abel? Now, Abel kept flocks, we're told. He keeps sheep and other cattle. Now, in a world where animals weren't used for eating, because they didn't eat animals before the flood, why would a family keep livestock? Well, Abel has discovered that the hair of these little beasts is great for keeping things warm. So he can cut their hair off, and he creates blankets and cushions which keep them warm during the night. And strangely, some of these animals produce milk which can be consumed by Adam and the family. And this milk is creamy and filling in a way that water from the river isn't. And Adam's shown his second son how to kill the animals and skin them to make durable clothes and shoes. Abel has to clear huge swathes of forest to create pens and grazing areas for his flocks. Sometimes he leaves the farm completely and wanders around with his flock on the mountain, uh, on the plain next to the mountain. And he makes weapons to defend himself against the wild animals. And he knows his flock by name. He calls them and they follow him. So we've got Cain and Abel and they're working together, both doing crucial jobs that benefit the family. Let's pretend Eve gives birth to another child, the 13th, and it's a girl, but the girl is sick. We now live in a sin-sick world, so the girl falls ill. And what do we do, Dad, asks Abel. What, what are we gonna do? I, I, the, the little one's ill, how are we gonna get over it? Well, says Adam, we're gonna go and seek a blessing from our Father, from the Lord. So what do they do? They climb the holy mountain. But before they do, Adam says to Abel, I want you to go and I want you to get the strongest firstborn animals from your flock. Bring me a sheep, one of those goats, and that thing I've called a cow. And they've got to be strong and they've got to be as perfect as possible. We're going to offer them to the Lord's. So Adam and his two sons, they start the steep climb up to the entrance of Eden. It's still there. Adam has a lump in his throat. As he approaches, he's got a deep pang of shame and regret. He used to live there. He longs to get back into the garden. Now suddenly as they turn a corner and see the gate of Eden, they also see something that modern readers wouldn't get we can't get our heads around right they see creatures that don't make any sense there are two beings let's call them beasts and they guard the gap in the rock they guard the gate of eden the first beast has the face of a lion but it stands upright like a man and it has wings it's huge let's say it's 10 foot tall 
The other beast is almost identical, but it has the face of an eagle. And if you're thinking Steve's gone nuts, read Ezekiel 1 later on, right, when you get home. As the men approach, the two beasts step forward, and from beneath their wings, they pull a huge sword. These swords are on fire, and they glow white hot. Adam and the boys can feel the heat of these swords on their faces. And the lion angel says to Adam, you cannot pass through here. Adam grabs the three animals from Abel, his son, and he brings them before the beasts and he slits their throat with a crude tool that he's made. And he says, their lives for ours. And blood pours from the neck of these three animals and it soaks into the ground. Adam orders Cain and Abel to cut up the animals, to cut off the meaty bits, the thigh, the rump, the belly, and they present the choicest pieces of meat to the two angels. And then the two angels take their swords and put it on the meat and it burns up. The meat is completely consumed by the fire. The beasts lower their swords and kneel. But they're not kneeling for the men because suddenly from inside the garden, a figure walks towards them. It appears in the form of a man. But this man, he shines brighter than the sun. If you could look at him, he would be glowing like bronze and his hair is white. Cain and Abel have never seen anything like it before. They are terrified. They don't need to ask who, who this is. They don't need to ask Adam who it is. They know. This is the Lord. This is who Adam used to walk in the garden with. The one Adam talked about. The one who created Adam and everything they see. And the three men fall on their faces. Their heads buried in the sand in fright. The Lord walks to the entrance of the garden. And as he does so, the earthly realm, because Eden is where heaven and earth coexist, but their realm starts to shake violently. There's a mighty wind, it's deafening. There's thunder, there's lightning. The rocks glow with heat. Cain and Abel are shaking with fear. Adam reaches out to reassure them. He says, look, don't fear, but remove your shoes. This is holy ground. And then suddenly all is calm. And a beautiful bright light fills the, the area. And suddenly the boys don't feel afraid anymore. In fact, there's total peace. They feel at rest in the world. The three men feel like they could just stay there forever. It's wonderful. It's like ointment on a wound. They feel comfort and love. The Lord says, Adam, my servant, what do you want? He says, Father, my youngest daughter is sick with a fever and she's dying and I don't know what to do. Please, Lord, say the words and she can be made whole. God says, go in peace. Your faith has saved her. Adam breathes a huge sigh of relief. And as suddenly as the light appeared, it's gone. The warm earth becomes cold again. Adam and Cain and Abel go back down to their home, back down the mountain, where they find Eve with the baby, and she's completely healed. And the family erupt in celebration. They praise the name of the Lord and they thank him for his mercy. And at supper, Adam explains to the boys and all of the other children what just occurred. He tells, him, he tells them the events of Genesis 3 and how God had slain an animal to make them skins to cover their sin and cover their shame. And now if they want an audience with the Lord, if they want to meet with God, if they want instruction and blessing, whenever they ascend the mountain, they must bring a firstborn from the flock. They are not worthy to come before God as they are. So they've got to bring a sacrifice if they're to meet with Yahweh. That's the only way, Adam tells them, you can approach God. Hebrews 11 verse 4 says this, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, 
Now, faith can only be exercised after information has been given, can't it? So if I say to Ad, Addy, I'll meet you at the Pie and Mash shop at 2 p.m. tomorrow, well, Addy either has faith in what I say or he doesn't, but information has been exchanged. The writer of Hebrews therefore suggests, I think, that Cain and Abel both knew exactly how they should approach God. I'm suggesting it's because they'd done it before with their father Adam. They'd approached God, they knew how to do it, they knew how it should be done. That's our story. We'll come back then to the next bit after our next hymn. Our next hymn is a short one. Here is love vast as the ocean. through the first bit next bit let's get into the text a bit more part two we've had a tale of two sons now we've got a tale of two offerings so a few months pass by Cain and Abel are getting older as I said they're now in their late teens they've become men they're ready perhaps to leave the farm and strike out on their own they're going to spread out with their own wives and they're going to go and subdue the earth. They're going to do what God's told them to do. Abel says to his dad, Dad, come with me to the gate of Eden. I wish to speak with the Lord. I want to receive his instruction and his blessing. I need him to tell me where to start my own little family. Adam says, Son, you don't need me to go up the mountain with you you're old enough you can go on your own you know the process take a firstborn from your flock when you get to the gate slay it their life for yours and the Lord will speak to you if your offering is acceptable the Lord will visit you and it will give you that blessing Abel's over the moon he's a man he's excited he runs from his house he can go and see God all by himself. He's thrilled. He runs straight to his barn and he begins picking out the best animals. But all of that excitement draws attention from his older brother Cain. Cain says to him, what are you doing? Abel says, I'm gonna climb the mountain. I'm going to the gate to speak with the Lord and receive my inheritance. I'm gonna get my land. And Cain's like, well, hang on a minute. Don't leave me out of this. I want to come too. I want to be blessed. I want my own farm. Brilliant, says Abel. 
We can go together. We'll go up there. Pick from my flock a sacrifice for yourself. But suddenly Cain's tone changes. What do you mean pick a, an animal from your flock? If I'm going up to see the Lord's, I'm going to bring my own offering. You want to bring sheep because you're good with the sheep. You, you want all the credit. You're good with animals so you can bring an animal. But I'm good with the soil. I'm going to bring a gift that I've made. I've worked hard. I've toiled. I've struggled to get my crops to grow. I'm going to show Yahweh what I've accomplished. I've overcome the cursed earth. Abel looks a bit concerned. He says, yeah, but, but Father told us to bring one of the fat offerings. Their life for ours. That's what God himself has said. Cain looks disparagingly at his younger brother and he says, did God really say you've got to kill one of the animals? I mean, that seems a little bit brutal, Abel. Sure, that's what we did last time. But look how good my fruit looks. It's pleasant to the eye. It, it tastes amazing. The Lord's going to love this. He wouldn't have tasted anything like it. We don't have to bring burnt offerings. I'll be okay. God will be happy with whatever I give him. Look at verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Cain and Abel climb the mountain as they had done with their father. Abel kills his animals and offers the fat. The fat is burned up by the swords and suddenly there's earthquake, there's wind, there's thunder, there's lightning, their shoes come off. And then the Lord appears. The boys lay prostrate on the ground like last time. Abel, my servant, what do you want? Lord, I'm leaving my father and my mother and I'm starting a new home with my wife. But where shall I go? God says, you can settle in the south with your wife. You've done well, my good and faithful servant. Go in peace. Look at the second half of verse 4. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering... He did not look with favour. Cain's there, he's expecting a response. What about me? What about my blessing? Is there instruction? God simply says, depart from me. Now, does Cain need to be told why God is giving him the cold shoulder? Well, of course he doesn't. He knows. But will Cain humbly accept the consequences of his disobedience. Will he go back down the mountain and grab a, grab a couple of animals and do what God has asked him? Well, no. Look at the end of verse 5. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Literally in the Hebrew, he was very angry and his face was angry. Cain thinks he's been hard done by, unfairly treated, and he's furious. I've dug, I've weeded, I've slaved away getting this fruit ready and I've lugged it all up here so that you and the beasts can eat it and enjoy it but you've turned your nose up at it. You think you're too good for my fruit and the rejection stings. Verse 6, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face angry? Why are you scowling at me, Cain? Verse 7, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you'd come up here obediently doing what you were instructed to do, I would have blessed you and sent you on your way. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Why have you brought me through when I've asked for a life? Well, it's because sin has started to creep into your house, Cain. It crouches at the door. You've allowed the serpent 
to sliver around in your mind. God says it desires to have you. This can get worse, Cain. You can keep listening to that sinful whisper. You can allow it to pounce on you and totally consume you, or you can rule over it. So Cain, don't let this anger, this resentment, this envy that's building in your heart towards your brother Abel, don't let it grow. Rule it and repent. Well, as Cain and Abel return home, back down the mountain, Cain's sin consumes him. The serpent who once whispered in his mother's ear now whispers to him. Abel, was, Abel has now got his land. He's got, he's got God's blessing. He's been accepted. And when they get home, Abel explains everything to Adam. And Adam's ecstatic. He hugs the younger son. Well done, boy. Excellent news. Praise the Lord. But with Cain, Adam's furious. What, what were you thinking? You've embarrassed me. Why can't you be like your brother? Why don't you listen? Well, now the serpent whispers again in Cain's ear. You're no longer the favourite, mate. And when the big chief dies, when Adam dies, where will that leave you? Abel will rule over you and you'll be humiliated. So the next day, Cain says to his brother, look, I want to do it right. I want to take an offering to the Lord. So take me out into the field so I can grab one of the best flock to, eat, uh, to, act, to act as an offering. Abel's all smiles. He loves his older brother. Sure, of course, he wants to see him blessed. I'll go with you out into the field. Cain, verse 8. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. The fact that their brothers is mentioned twice. Moses wants to bring home the point. This is shocking. There were only, I think, 13 or 14 human beings actually alive at this time, and now Cain's killed one of them, the one closest to him. Why? Well, because of envy and pride. Is it a big rock smashed over the back of Cain's head or a knife in the back? We're not sure. Cain probably buries the body. Adam will simply think that one of the big animals has got him. And in a final act of treachery, I think, Cain steals a couple of sheep and heads back up the mountain. Up he goes, slays the animals as he should have done in the first place. There's earthquake, wind, fire, the shoes come off, the Lord appears. Verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? He was with you last time, what, what's happened to him? Cain says, I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's keeper? Now remember, when Adam and Eve had been caught in their sin in the garden, they started blaming other people. But Cain has gone a step lower, hasn't he? He's now just audaciously telling lies to God's face. He says, I've no idea where he is. Verse 10, the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. In our text, do you notice that Abel never speaks, but now God hears his voice. Instead of animal blood spilt on the ground, Cain has spilt the blood of his own brother. The world has been turned on its head. Verse 11, now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. God sentences Cain and he punishes him and the punishment fits the crime. Why had Cain become so proud? Well, it was his ability to work the ground. God had cursed the ground, but using his ingenuity, Cain had overcome it. But now, no matter how hard Cain works and how much he digs and fertilizes and weeds, he's gonna get nothing from it. God's cursed him and the ground together. The ground is not gonna work with him. And therefore, Cain will have to roam around in the forest 
and he's going to have to forage for wild fruits and berries. In fact, he's going to be like Bear Grylls, you know, Bear Grylls goes around the forest eating trash. That's what Cain's going to have to do. Verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you're driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. When he was by the mountain, he could have asked God for anything. He could exist in the comforting surroundings of the gate of Eden. And he could ask God for advice and blessing and healing. But now that was all over. His parents were driven out of the garden. Now he's driven off of the mountain completely. He says, I will be a restless wonder on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. When my younger brothers and father find out what I've done, they're gonna want revenge and they'll come looking for me and they'll hunt me down and my dad will kill me. <clears throat> Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. We're not told what this mark is, but Adam and the rest of his family now know that they're not to touch their exiled son. He will wander around in the forest, separated from the family of God. Verse 16, so Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, that's the land of wandering, east of Eden. The one who we thought would usher in a new era, the one on whom all of our hopes rested, well, he's only made things worse, hasn't he? Rather than crush the serpent, he's channeled the serpent. Instead of eternal life, he's only brought more death. And rather than returning to Eden, he's been cast even further away to the land of Nod, the land of wandering. Okay, that's the story. How do we close then? Well, Jesus calls Abel a prophet. So listen to Luke's gospel, chapter 11, verse 49. This is Jesus speaking, Luke 11, 49. God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. First thing to notice is that Jesus believes this story here in Genesis. He doesn't put it down to ancient myth. He doesn't say this is a cautionary tale. Jesus says this story is true, not necessarily my iteration of it, right? But the actual text we've got in Genesis. Jesus believes in a literal reading of the book, a real Adam, a real Eve, a real Cain, a real Abel. But he refers to Abel as a prophet. Why? Well, what did Abel do? Abel recognized that he was a sinner. And he was aware of his own wickedness. He was aware of God's majesty and power and holiness. And he was aware of his own wretchedness. He knew he couldn't approach God on his own terms. So he offered a sacrifice. He obeyed God. An innocent would die on his behalf. So Lord, don't, don't kill me. Let your wrath fall on one of these lambs, one of these sheep, one of these oxen. Why does Jesus call Abel a prophet? Well, it's because Abel's experience points towards the true Lamb of God, doesn't it? Yahweh, the one who shines like molten bronze and shines brighter than the sun, and he's worshipped by the heavenly host, well, he would step out of that gate into Adam's broken world. And Jesus died for Adam's helpless race, didn't he? No longer would animals have to pay the price for human sin, but now a perfect man would die for an imperfect humanity. So that all now who call on Jesus as their Lord and Saviour can once again be united with the Father, 
They can go back into an Edenic state. So Abel is a prophet pointing to Jesus. But notice finally then that the world is full of canes. Maybe there are canes sitting in the church tonight. You've heard the gospel a thousand times. You've heard that you need a sacrifice. You need a good, perfect life in place of your own, in exchange for your bad one. You need to have your sins washed away. If you want heaven, if you want a relationship with God, then the only thing you dare offer him is Jesus as your true lamb. You hear that, but sin is crouching at the door. And the serpent whispers in your ear, you're not that bad, he says. You work hard. In fact, I know this week you've tried to be good. And there are plenty of people in society worse than you. And surely God can't be that brutal, can he? I mean, a man dying on a cross because you've told the odd little white lie. Did God really say that's how you should be made righteous? I mean, surely, surely you've got to put some effort in. Surely you've got to bring a, a, a little bit of your own stuff. And look at all the great things you do for God. You come to church. You put money in the collection. You shut your eyes during the prayer. You sing pretty well at times. You've tried really hard this week not to swear at anyone. And I mean, if that's not good enough for God, then I don't know what is. He's never happy. You can never be good enough for him. You're trying your best. You're only human. So why won't God accept you as you are? Well, friends, if that's you tonight, if you think you can come to God like Cain on your own terms and that God will simply give you two big thumbs up, well, then you're very much mistaken. Understand that if you do that, you'll face the same sentence as Cain. Cain wasn't invited into Eden. In fact, he was driven even further away into a land of despair and exile. But those who reject Jesus' offer of salvation, they'll be driven away and exiled for all eternity into a place of darkness and regret and wailing. And God will cast you away like trash forever and ever. Hebrews 11.4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commended him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Hear the message of Abel this evening. Let go of your worthless fruit. Let go of your pride. Stop trying to approach God on your own terms and with your own righteousness stuffed in your back pocket. It won't work. Return from wandering around in the world trying to make it on your own. And instead, come to the Father through Jesus, his son. He died on a cross and rose again so that sinners like us can be saved and welcomed back into the presence of God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that we don't have to come with our own righteousness. We don't have to come with our own attempts to justify ourselves before you, Lord, because if we did, we'd be doomed. Lord, we thank you that Abel, offering those sacrifices back at the beginning, Lord, was pointing to our true and wonderful sacrifice, pointing to the true Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Lord, we thank you that you have done everything to make a way back into heaven, a way back into a new heaven, a new earth, where Eden will not only be returned, but it will be even better because there'll be no sin and no temptation and no pain and suffering and, and, and none of those threats that Adam and Eve faced. So Lord, we pray that we wouldn't be like Cain, Lord, relying on our own works, relying on our own tick list of things that we feel we should do. 
Lord, we thank you that you've done it all through Christ, that it's his blood that is shed, that washes us and makes us acceptable before you. Hear our prayers then, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.